Good morning, good morning. Today is Tuesday, August 3rd. We have starting the book of Zechariah, with chapters 1 through 4, Psalm 60, and we will start with the video about, overview about Zechariah. So let's take a deep breath and we'll ask the Lord's blessing on this time. Heavenly Father, we just ask that you be with us right now, that you open our eyes and our hearts to your word, give us understanding and wisdom, fill us with your spirit, Lord Jesus. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay, Zechariah's visions foster hope in future promise of the Messianic kingdom and challenge Israel after the exile to remain faithful to their God. Okay, let's watch the video. The book of the prophet Zechariah. The book is set after the return of the exiles from Babylon to Jerusalem. And we're told in the book of Ezra that Zechariah and Haggai together challenged and motivated the people to rebuild the temple and look for the fulfillment of God's promises. Now long ago, Jeremiah the prophet had said that Israel's exile would last for 70 years and that afterwards God would restore his presence to a new temple and bring his kingdom and the rule of the Messiah over all nations. The dates at the beginning of this book tell us that those 70 years are almost up. But life back in the land was hard and it seemed like none of these promises were going to come true. Why? And the book of Zechariah offers an explanation. It has a fairly clear design. There's an introduction which sets the tone for a large collection of Zechariah's dream visions. And that's concluded by chapters 7 and 8. And then this is followed by two more large collections of poetry and prophecy. Let's just dive in and see how the book works. It begins with Zechariah's challenge to his generation to turn back to God and not be like their ancestors who rebelled and refused to listen to the earlier prophets, which landed them in exile. And so now the returned exiles respond positively to Zechariah. They repent and humble themselves before God, or so it seems. The next large section is a collection of eight nighttime visions that Zechariah experienced. And just to prepare you, these are full of very bizarre, strange images, a lot like your dreams. The idea that God communicates to people through symbolic dreams, it's very old. It goes back to the book of Genesis. The dreams of Jacob or Joseph or Pharaoh, these gave meaning to current events at the time, but they also gave a window into the future. And so Zechariah has his own dreams now, and they've been arranged in this really cool symmetrical design. The first and the last visions are about four horsemen each. They're like rangers patrolling the world on God's behalf, and it's a representation of God's attentive watch over the nations. Their report is that the world is at peace. And in Zechariah's day, this refers to how God raised up Persia to conquer Babylon and bring peace. And so the question now arises, the 70 years of Israel's exile are almost up, is now the time for the messianic kingdom in Jerusalem? And God responds by saying that he's determined to fulfill the those promises, but he leaves the question of timing unanswered. The second and seventh visions are paired because they're both reflections on Israel's past sin that led up to the exile. So the second vision is about these horns that symbolize the nations that attacked and then scattered Israel, Assyria and Babylon. But then these horns or empires are themselves scattered by a group of blacksmiths, an image for Persia. The seventh dream is about a woman in a basket and we're told that she's a symbol of the centuries of Israel's covenant rebellion. And then this woman is carried off to Babylon by other women who carry the basket flying with stork wings. This is so strange. The third and sixth visions are paired as they're both about the rebuilding of a new Jerusalem. So a man is measuring the city. It's an image of God's promise that Jerusalem will be rebuilt and become a beacon to the nations who will join God's people in worship. And then the sixth dream is about a scroll that flies around the new Jerusalem punishing thieves and liars. The idea being that the new Jerusalem is a place that's purified from sin by the scriptures. The fourth and fifth visions are at the center of this collection and they're about the two key leaders among the returned exiles. So Joshua, the high priest, and then Zerubbabel, the royal descendant of David. So Joshua had been symbolically wearing Israel's sin in the form of these dirty clothes. But then those are taken off and he's given new clothes and a new turban, a symbol of God's grace and forgiveness. And then an angel tells Joshua that if he remains faithful to God, he will lead his people and Joshua will become a symbol of the future messianic king. 
The other vision is about two olive trees that supply oil to this elaborate gold lamp, which itself is a symbol of God's watchful eye over his people. And these two trees symbolize the two anointed leaders, Joshua and then Zerubbabel, who is leading the temple rebuilding efforts. And God says that success will not come to this new temple if it's the result only of political maneuvering. Rather, these two leaders must be dependent upon the work of God's Spirit. The visions come to a close with a bonus vision from the prophet, and it picks up the themes of the central fourth and fifth visions. It's Joshua, the high priest again, and he's given a crown and presented as a symbol of the future Messiah who will also be a priest over God's kingdom. And then Zechariah closes it all out saying that all of these visions will be fulfilled only if the current generation is faithful to God and obeys the terms of the covenant. And so altogether, these three visions emphasize how the coming of the Messianic kingdom is conditional upon this generation being faithful to God. Which leads to the conclusion of the dreams. It's another challenge from Zechariah, and a group of Israelites come and they've been mourning over the former temple's destruction for nearly 70 years. And they ask him, is it time to stop grieving? I mean, is God's kingdom going to come very soon? And Zechariah again reminds them of how their ancestors rejected God's call through the prophets, which led to the exile. And so he challenges them too. He says, this generation will see the messianic kingdom only if they pursue justice and peace and remain faithful to the covenant. So in other words, Zechariah reverses their question. He asks, are you going to become the kind of people who are ready to receive and participate in God's coming kingdom? And that question is left just hanging there. The people don't answer and the book just moves on. And so we come to the final sections that are very different from chapters 1 to 8. Each section is a kaleidoscopic collage of poems and images about the future messianic kingdom. So the first one, chapters 9 to 11, describe the coming of the humble messianic king who's riding a donkey into the new Jerusalem to establish God's kingdom over the nations. But then, all of a sudden, this king, he's symbolized as a shepherd over the flock of Israel, and then he's rejected first by his own people, but then also by their leaders who are also symbolized as shepherds. And so God hands Israel over to these corrupt shepherds and it raises the question, will Israel's rejection of their king last forever? In the final section, chapters 12 to 14, say no. It's another mosaic of poems and images about the future messianic kingdom. And they depict the new Jerusalem as a place where God's justice will finally confront and defeat evil among the nations. It's very similar to the same themes in prophet Joel or Ezekiel. But then God also will confront the rebellion within the hearts of his own people. He's going to pour out his spirit on them, he says, so that they can repent and grieve over the fact that they have rebelled and rejected their messianic shepherd. The final chapter concludes with the new Jerusalem as the gathering point for all of the nations. And then this city becomes a new Garden of Eden and there's a river of living water flowing out of the temple bringing healing to all of creation and that's how the book ends. And so Zechariah just leaves you to ponder the connection between chapters 1 through 8 and 9 to 14. And the point seems to be that this future messianic kingdom of the book's second half will only come when God's people are faithful to the covenant the point of the first half. Reading the book of Zechariah is a wild ride. These visions and poems are full of startling imagery and they do not follow a linear flow of thought. And that's part of the point. It's like history and our lives. It doesn't always fit into neat orderly patterns. But the prophets offer us glimpses of God's hand at work, guiding history towards his own purposes. And so ultimately, Zechariah invites us to look above the chaos and hope for the coming of God's kingdom, which should motivate faithfulness in the present. And that's what the book of Zechariah is all about. All right, let's get into Zechariah chapter 1. In the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, son of Edu, saying, The Lord was very angry with your fathers. Therefore say to them, Thus declares the Lord of hosts, Return to me, 
says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Do not be like your fathers, to whom the former prophets cried out. Thus says the Lord of hosts, return from your evil ways and from your evil deeds. But they did not hear or pay attention to me, declares the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? And the prophets, do they live forever? But my words and my statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, did they not overtake your fathers? So they repented and said, as the Lord of hosts purposed to deal with us for our ways and deeds, so he has dealt with us. On the 24th day of the 11th month, which is the month of Shabbat, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, son of Edu, saying, I saw in the night, and behold, a man riding on a red horse. He was standing among the myrtle trees in the glen, glen, and behind him were red, sorrel, and white horses. Then I said, What are these, my lord? The angel who talked with me said to me, I will show you what they are. So the man who was standing among the myrtle trees answered, These are they whom the Lord has sent to patrol the earth. They And they answered the angel of the Lord who was standing among the myrtle trees and said, We have patrolled the earth, and behold, all the earth remains at rest. Then the angel of the Lord said, The Lord of hosts, how long will you have no mercy on Jerusalem and the cities of Judah against which you have been angry these seventy years. And the Lord answered gracious and comforting words to the angel who talked with me. So the angel who talked with me said to me, Cry out. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion. I am exceedingly angry with the nations that are at ease. For while I was angry, but a little, they furthered the disaster. Therefore, thus says the Lord, I have returned to Jerusalem with mercy. My house shall be built in it declares the Lord of hosts, and measuring the lo- and the measuring line shall be stretched out over Jerusalem. Cry out again, thus says the Lord of hosts, my cities shall again overflow with prosperity, and the Lord will again comfort Zion and again choose Jerusalem. And then I lifted my eyes and saw, and behold, four horns. And I said to the angel who talked with me, what are these? And he said to me, these are the horns that have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Then the Lord showed me four craftsmen. And I said, what are these coming to do? And he said, these are the horns that scattered Judah, so no one raised his head. And these have come to terrify them, to cast down the horns of the nations who lifted up their horns against the land of Judah to scatter it. Chapter 2. And I lifted my eyes and saw, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. Then I said, Where are you going? And he said to me, To measure Jerusalem and to see what its width and what its what is its length. And behold, the angel who talked with me came forward, and another angel came forward to meet him and said to him, Run, say to that young man, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as villages without walls because of the multitude of people and livestock in it. And I will be to her a wall of fire all around, declares the Lord, and I will bring and I will be the glory in her midst. Up, up, flee to the land of the north, declares the Lord, for I have spread you abroad as the four winds of the heavens, declares the Lord. Up, escape to Zion, you who dwell with the daughter of Babylon, for thus says the Lord of hosts, after his glory sent me to the nations who plundered you, for he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. Behold, I will shake my hand over them, and they shall become plunder for those who have served him. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me, sing and rejoice, O daughters of Zion. For behold, I come, and I will dwell in your midst, declares the Lord. And many nations shall join themselves to the Lord in that day, and shall be my people. And I will dwell in your midst, and you shall know that I am the Lord of hosts. Who, You shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you, and the Lord will inherit Judah as his portion in the Holy Land, and will again choose Jerusalem. Be silent, all flesh, before the Lord, for he has roused himself from his holy dwelling. Chapter 3. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. It is not... Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was standing now Joshua was standing before the angel clothed with filthy garments and the angel said to those who were standing before him remove the filthy garments from him and to, to him he said behold I have taken your iniquity away from you and I will clothe you with pure vestments and I said let them put a clean turban on his head so they put a clean 
turban on his head and clothed him with garments, and the angel of the Lord was standing by. And the angel of the Lord solemnly assured Joshua, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you will walk in my ways and keep my charge, then you shall rule my house and have charge over my charge of my courts, and I will give you the right of access among those who are standing here. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, you and your friends who sit before you, for they are men who are a sign. Behold, I will bring my servant the branch. For behold, on the stone that I have set before Joshua, on a single stone with seven eyes, I will engrave its inscription, declares the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of the land in a single day. In that day, declares the Lord of hosts, every one of you will invite his neighbor to come under his vine and under his fig tree. And the Chapter 4. And the angel who talked with me came again and woke me, like a man who is awakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, What do you see? And I said, I, I see, and behold, a lampstand of all gold, with a bowl on top of it, and seven lamps on it, and seven lips on each of the lamps that are on top of it. And there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on its left. And I said to the angel who talked with me, What are these, my lord? Then he, the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? I said, No, my Lord. Then he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel you shall become a plain, and he shall bring forward the top stone amid shouts of, amid shouts of grace, grace to it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of, his, of this house. His hands shall also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For whoever has despised the day of small things shall rejoice and shall see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. These seven, these seven are the eyes of the Lord, which range through the whole earth. Then I said to him, What are these two olive trees on the right and the left of the lampstand? And a second time I answered, and I said to him, What are these two branches of the olive trees which are beside the two golden pipes from which the golden oil is poured out? And he said to me, Do you not know what these are? I said, No, my Lord. Then he said, These are the two anointed ones who stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Wow, let's move into a time of prayer and meditate on Psalm 60. It's titled, He Will Tread Down Our Foes. It's to the choir master, according to the Shushan Edith, the Miktam of David, for instruction, when he strove with Aram Naharim and with Aram Zobah, and when jo Joab, on his return, struck down 12,000 of Edom in the Valley of Salt. O oh God, you have rejected us, broken our defenses. You have been angry. O oh, restore us. You have made the land to quake. You have torn it open. Repair its breaches, for it totters. You have made your people see hard things. You have given us wine to drink that made us stagger. You have set up a banner for those who fear you, that they may flee to it from the bow. Selah. That your beloved ones may be delivered. Give salvation by your right hand and answer us. God has spoken in his holiness. With exultation I will divide up Shechem and portion out the vow, the vow, veil of Succoth. Gilead is mine. Manasseh is mine. Ephraim is my helmet. Judah is my scepter. Moab is my wash basin. Upon Edom I cast my shoe. Over Philistia I shout in triumph. Who will bring me to the fortified city? Who will lead me to Edom? Have you not rejected us, O God? You do not go forth, O God, with our armies. O oh, grant us help against the foe, for vain is the salvation of man. With God we shall do valiantly. It is he who will tread down our foes. O oh, Heavenly Father, it is so true that salvation, vain is the salvation of man. It's worthless. Man can't save anything. But with you, Lord, we will do valiantly. It is you who tread down the enemy. It is you in whom we stand. It's not by our might or our power, but it's by your spirit, by your spirit. It says you, Lord. 
Thank you, Father, for loving us so much, for being our power and our strength and our salvation, for being our everything, Lord. Help us, Lord, to be people that are ready for the new kingdom, for your kingdom, Lord. Help us to be people that are living for your kingdom. Lord, that we would be prepared, that we would be helping to you to prepare others, Lord. Not that we help you, Lord, but you work through us for some reason, Lord. You allow us to help out. Lord, we're so thankful that you love us so much. And Father, we just ask that you be with those today that uh, are suffering. I think of the grief of Michaela and her family with the loss of her grandmother, Lord. We just ask that you would provide peace and comfort. It's a very difficult time. It's very difficult for us, Lord. We see these bodies uh, end, Lord. But we know our spirit continues on, Lord. It doesn't uh, remove the loss and the pain, Lord. Father, we just lift that family up to you and also the family that Samantha mentioned, Lord, that she knows that uh, experienced the loss of a family member as well, Lord. Father, we ask you to be with Trish and Pam and those that are suffering, Al and Chris and Dan and just uh, those that are suffering in pain. We lift them up to you. We ask for your healing hand and relief of pain, Lord. Uh, today, we ask that you be with Bailey and Parker and the doctors and uh, say try to uh, get this uh, baby going, Lord, to come out. Lord, it's ultimately in your hands. And Father, we just ask that it would go well, Lord, that everything would be uh, uh, work out for the best, Lord, and that, uh, and that Bailey and the, the baby would be uh, healthy and, uh, and would just get through this, Lord. So, Father, we just lift them up to you, and Lord, be with us today. Let us be just a great day, productive day, worshiping you, glorifying you, Lord, reflecting you to the world around us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, have a great day, guys.